Uh, so I think those kinds of experiences are uh, what drive people to believe things. In fact, most of the time we just form the belief, first for a whole host of emotional, psychological reasons, and then after the fact, we rationalize the belief with a whole bunch of good reasons that we've collected over time. And then when you say, well, why do you believe that? You rattle off the reason, <coughs> leaving out the real reason, <laughs> which you do recognize in others. Well, great talk, by the way. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. You know, when you ask a question, for example, if God exists or not, I think there are uh, two components to it. One is purely academic and cerebral exercise to find out the truth for that answer. But the other component is the emotional attachment that people have for that answer, whatever it may be. Uh, I think many people believe something not because how rational, how logical it sounds, but because what it does to them personally. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you really have to be very objective and be able to accept the answer if it, if it doesn't uh, jive with what you already believe that makes you feel good. So people would rather believe in a hopeful lie than accept a hopeless truth. And uh, for many, many times, I come across some people who are believers and I tell them about all this and they say, well, I have made up my mind, don't confuse me with facts. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder if you come across but, uh, that kind of but situation. But wait, did they really say that? Yes, actually. They, they, you I, said your some film? People, he made a film on uh, belief in God. Uh, no, no, I made a film about, from a, I'm a neurosurgeon by profession, as I said, from a brain surgeon's perspective, with 21st century knowledge, if God exists or not. So if you want to find out, you can watch that. Uh, where, where, in, uh, where, where can people get now, Right now, it's in Film Festival Circuit. Okay. Right. It'll come out uh, maybe March or May, but American Humanist Association is showing that movie. Now, What's it uh, called? Creator of God, a brain surgeon story. Okay, but, there you go. But, but, but <laughs> absolutely, as I was listening to you, that's not the reason I asked this question. Uh, but do you also come across, uh, it, it goes with the very first question, you know, where are you preaching to the choir or what do you do when people say that kind of stuff to you? Well, so, I mean, on one hand, you can't take away somebody's experience or change it, but you can, you can ask them what their arguments are and, and, and then just dialogue with them about that and also talk about things like the number one reason the number one religion, predictor of somebody's religion is what their parents' religion was, where they happen to have been born. That's going to at least give somebody pause, even if it's only for a nanosecond. <laughs> it's often about all you can get. Uh, and so, but at least it gives give pause, something like that. That you can, that you can point to. Is there some sort of uh, single event or combination of events that instigated the skeptical way in which you look at the world, or have you always had a scientific, rational type mind? Oh, I, no. <laughs> I was a born again, actually, born again evangelical Christian when I was in high school. My parents weren't religious. This was a peer group influence thing. Um, my best friend was, and he, uh, well, he had this really cute sister that I liked, and <laughs> so I was probably motivated uh, to listen to him a little more carefully than maybe I would have. But anyway, I got into it, I did, and the thing with the girl didn't work out, but that's okay. I, I got into Bible classes, and I went to Pepperdine University as a major in theology, and I didn't really just want to be a college professor, because it's the greatest gig going to me. <laughs> really. Anyway, don't ever listen. When they complain about their pay, forget it. It's a great job. Uh, and, uh, but to do that, you have to have a PhD and have a PhD in theology. You have to master Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, and Latin. I can really get through Spanish. So I, I switched to what I could do pretty well, which is statistics and research methodologies and science, experimental psychology, and that kind of led me to study the brain, cis-cultural anthropology, social psychology, all that. And it was pretty obvious to me by graduate school that religions are socially constructed. And I, I do remember one, my high school buddy, Frank, uh, who was a Jehovah Witness, which I didn't really understand what that meant at the time. I just remembered he was a Christian, and he always wanted me to be a Christian. And so with my other buddy, George, with the sister, talked me into it, and I did it. And I went, that was on a Friday, and on Sunday, uh, Monday, I went back to class. I said, Frank, I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian now. He says, well, what kind is it? It's a, it's a Presbyterian. He goes, oh, no, oh, no, no, my, no, that's, that's the wrong one. I'm like, the wrong one? So that, that sort of planted a little seed of doubt, like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> they, they're having these sort of mutually exclusive claims. And they can't all be right. What are the main um, uh, causes for people not believing that the Holocaust happened? Uh, well, I guess probably the most obvious motivation is anti-Semitism. It, it's, really, it's really there. 
the, the sort of uh, uh, anti-Zionism or the belief that um, that Israel uses the Holocaust as a moral lever to get um, U.S. support for Middle East policies, actual financial support, military support for um, for Israel, and so on. And so, if you can pull that out, that that is pull that moral lever out, that that, that pulls the power away. That that's the theory. That's the idea. Uh, so, of course, the, the actual method of doing it is exactly the same as the creationists use. Same techniques, you know, you quote mining from Holocaust scholars. Oh, for example, back to the, the confabulation problem of memory, um, you'll often encounter Holocaust survivors that are fairly old now, and, uh, and they'll describe in great detail their experiences at Auschwitz. Auschwitz Birkenau with uh, Mengele, there he was in uniform standing there, you know, doing his selection, and he pointed at me, and you know, and so on. Anyway, if you actually look at the dates when they were there, Mengele had already left. This couldn't have happened. This didn't happen. Another one I remember when I was, wrote a book about this, I interviewed a lot of these survivors, and another one vividly remembers, you know, flames coming out of the chimney. And there's even paintings of this. Uh, and, and it's impossible because the crematoria like structure is here where they're burning bodies and there's this long like channel and then uh, uh, where, where the smoke goes down and then the chimney's over here. There's no way flames are going to do this. Impossible. What did they see? They saw some movie or they saw this painting. So they're confabulating what really happened with later stories, other people's stories, films, books, TV shows, and so on. And of course the, the deniers, they jump all over that. You see, he lied. No, no, it's not a lie. It's, you know, memory confabulation or confusion. Everybody does that. It's not a lie. It's a lie. They made that up. If they made that up, they made up the gas chamber story. They made up the crematoria story. Nobody was gas. Pretty soon, you know, the Nazis were running a club med. Uh, and if it wasn't for the Allies bombing the rail lines that went to the gas chamber, that went to the camps, uh, then nobody would have starved. And so it's the Allies' fault. And anyway, this goes on and on. But what's behind it is, you know, we, we don't like that the Jews have so much power and control, and especially in, in Middle Eastern politics in America. That's, 